This is a program that we have uh, to recycle the plastic films that cannot go into the recycling stream uh, up at Wachusett or at any other place that uh, can process plastics, hard plastics and whatever. They can't recycle uh, these little plastic bags that we have. This is a film. This is a number four, number two uh, plastic film. They can't recycle them. These can't go into the normal waste stream because they screw up the machines that do the sorting and all. So they have, have to be handled differently. Now, Trex is a company that builds this composite decking material. Uh, and they have been trying to develop their recycling collection network. Uh, they're in North Carolina. They're building another plant, I think, out in uh, Utah. And they have a program where they usually collect from supermarkets. And the supermarkets t take the bags they collect at the location, bring it to the warehouses. The warehouse bails it. And Trex sends a trailer out to pick up the tonnage of plastic bags and turns it into that decking material uh, that you see. Now, they can take any kind of plastic uh, in that, not any type of plastic, the number two and the number fours, and I got some slides and they don't seem to want to work, but the idea is, is the type of plastics that we can put into these boxes or to the supermarkets that you go to, and most supermarkets are plugged into the Trek system uh, my job is to get people to understand what to put into this waste stream, get you to see how simple it is, and putting a box in a location like the Sterling Center has been great, because everybody gets to know it's simple, we can put our plastics in there, but we need to put the right kind of plastics into the box. And basically what we can put in there is what's up on the screen, uh, and anything that's a plastic polyethylene film, uh, it has to be clean. Uh, it can't have any food materials in it. Ziploc bags and things like that can go in the box. They have to be clean. Uh, the plastic wrap that comes on your water bar bottles, the uh, plastic film that they use to shrink wrap, pallets can be used. The stuff out of your salt bags can be used, but it's got to be rinsed out clean. There can't be any. Uh, materials in it. Could you, uh, my, I've, I've been doing this, and one of the, it, sometimes it's a little hard to figure out when what you can recycle. But one of the things that they said in the on their website is, if you can't stretch it out, you can't recycle it. Yeah. yeah. So, if, so if, 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 you know, like cereal box bags, those I can't. Yeah, can't those don't them, those so don't work. Those there's some question about like these candy wrappers with the little goodies inside. Uh, I've been sending it down to them as part of the, and they haven't come back and said anything to me about it. Really? Yeah, so I'm not sure whether it's okay. And I need a clarification because they say they can use those Amazon plastic bags that come in, mm -hmm. the mailers. Mm -hmm. Well, there's one mailer that comes out that's definitely a shrink wrap uh, type material that's hard. But then there's the other that's more of a cardboard reinforced. So I got to get a clarification from them on that. But in any case, the label that comes on that uh, bag or your shipping, uh, whatever comes in from Amazon, cut it out because that's paper. And we don't want to put that in there. So that's the program. The program that we've been using, and we did it once already here at the Sterling Senior Center, was if we gave them 500 pounds of plastic, they would give us a bench. And we got a bench out of it. Uh, I've got several programs going on with senior centers in our area. Uh, and I'm hoping next year we can do another program with the town of Sterling again and get another bench. But they up the amount. We've got to give them from 500 pounds to 1,000 pounds. How many little plastic bags is that? <laughs> About 88,000. <laughs> so, uh, it's a... Uh, that's a great program. The stuff can't go into the waste stream, so we got the program to do it. It's easy to continue. Whoops, I went too far. Anyway, uh, that's basically what I got to say about plastics. I want the uh, electricity people to tell you all about what they've got going on up there, uh, which is great too. We got my feeling is we've got to recycle as much as we can, and if we can get these products 
uh, give them a second life or whatever, and something that will last for a while, like that bench, should last quite and a few number of years. One of the things Dick yep. didn't mention is that we now have three of these collection sites. We have the Sterling Senior Center, we have Town Hall, Thank you. and two weeks ago we got the library. And it's because the library has additional hours. And you know, you got all day Saturday, you can bring things into the library. We might add that we are filming this, and this is all going to go on YouTube under Sterling. So we'll uh, notify you when that's available. Usually it takes a week or two to get it up. Okay? Well, thank you. Thanks, Dick. Your turn. Are we up? Yep. Well, thanks, Dick, for that. Um, so thanks for Paul Cormier for inviting us back to the Sterling Senior Center and talking to the Dull Men's Club. Dull Persons Club, maybe, it should be called. Um, <laughs> so uh, last time I was here, or we were here, was back in May of 2022. And some things have changed since then in the recycling landscape and our operations at the Senior Center. So Norma Chanis and myself will hopefully walk you through what's going on and some of the things we encounter at the, senior, or at the uh, Recycling Center uh, that can impact what you do you know, in your homes and on your curbside. So I do want to say what our, our experience is with the drop-off side of recycling um, and how we operate with the materials we get. We don't really have much experience with your curbside operations here in Sterling. So those questions specifically for curbside should be directed to your town officials. Um, our seven towns, four of them have curbside recycling and trash and three of them have private subscription where the homeowner subscribes to a hauler to come by uh, on their own and it's not through the municipality. So I only have a handful of slides to go through some about the recycling center, uh, some about Sterling's impact to the recycling center, uh, a little bit on recycling and new waste bands that came up and uh, I guess we're just going to wing it from there. <laughs> see if I remember how to do this. So Wachusett Earth Day has been around for a very long time, started in the 90s as a grassroots organization to do hazardous waste collection. Um, as waste bans occurred in the state, things were added. Those collections only happened twice a year. In 2006 or 7, we were incorporated and it was determined we needed a permanent site. Um, so that site is where we are now on Raymond Huntington Highway in West Boylston. Um, this picture is actually, I think, from 2006 or early 2017, and it's not really accurate of what it looks like now. Um, but the site itself, the Wachusett Watershed Regional and Recycling Center, is a partnership between the Department of Conservation and Recreation, Wachusett Earth Day, which runs the operations, and this, each seven towns that participate. Um, some things that are off on this picture, we have a new check-in shed. Uh, the semi-trailer is moved and now we have a drop-off near there. We have styrofoam collection containers for the number six white styrofoam. Uh, we have containers out back for electronics and mattress recycling. And we just put up a new furniture reuse pavilion, which Norma was instrumental in identifying and shepherding through in that launched this January officially. Mm -hmm. Would you like to say anything about the pavilion, or should I keep going? Oh, you can keep going. Okay. <laughs> but really what it does is allows us to keep furniture safe for longer periods of time to give the opportunity for a resident to come and reuse it. Before, it was just piled outside because we didn't have the space. And you know the weather here. If it rains, a lot of things do get destroyed, and we had to throw away a lot of stuff. So come by. If you haven't seen it, come by and visit. It's, it's pretty impressive. Um, so for Sterling's impact on the recycling center, um, we get about 24 to 26,000 cars a year coming through. Um, one of the reasons we do have to check residency is so we can track some of these numbers. Um, Sterling is the third in population of our seven towns, tied for third. 
um, but it's the second in usage. So Sterling residents have a strong history of recycling, and I think that happens, that comes out of having a transfer station at the DPW years ago. So about 5,500 and up to over close to 6,000 Sterling cars come through our site every year, or has been. Um, for just for a general drop-off summary, not specifically to Sterling, we get about 230,000 pounds of material, and that's just the material dropped off to our building for reuse. That has nothing to do with the recycling or the trash, um, other stuff on site. Um, and out of that, 52,000 pounds are not reusable, so that either gets diverted right to the trash, to one of our recycling bins, whether it's paper, cardboard, rigid plastic, styrofoam. And then we do have some uh, partnerships that we give material to. Um, the furniture banks, they take some dishware that's been sitting around um, and other, other household goods out of the building. We box up a lot of the Christmas items that come in year round and that gets stored for Restore or Habitat for Humanity for a fundraiser they have around Thanksgiving time each year. So if you go down to that fundraiser, uh, I think it's the Holiday Hootenanny, a lot of that material might have come from us. Um, and then we do get a lot of books um, and we have a youth run organization called More Than Words that we have bins on site for. And we do divert several, a lot of our books to them um, in 24,000 pounds of books in one year. Um, and that really skews our 22%, you know, unusable, unacceptable rate. So it's, it should be down, without the books, it's around 12%. So we collect all this information and once a year we have to report it back to the towns so they, the towns can report it back to the de Department of Environmental and um, Environmental Protection um, in an annual survey. So again, we, Sterling was about 22% of the usage, so we just skew, we just uh, proportion each of our numbers for Sterling. So we call out mixed recyclables, which is similar to your curbside cans and in bottles, paper and corrugated, that would um, duplicate what you do on the curbside. Not everybody has curbside collection, apartments and condos generally don't. So this is an opportunity for those residents to come and recycle that material. Uh, bulky plastics, think of your kids' slides, your trash cans, your bins, number two buckets, um, high density polyethylene buckets. Um, anything that's not a container, but plastic can be considered bulky plastic. Um, metal, all types of metal, including appliances and lawn mowers. Um, textiles. We do a lot of textiles, e-waste, styrofoam, the number six styrofoam, and lead acid batteries. So those all get collected and recycled through our site. And mattresses and refrigerants, um, ACs, uh, dehumidifiers, and refrigerators and freezers. Uh, those company that takes that, they recover the refrigerants and sell it back to the manufacturers. Um, so that gets cleaned out and reused. So as you can see, um, you know, the biggest thing is metal, obviously, but Sterling residents dropped off almost 20,000 pounds of cardboard, you know, at our site, which is pretty healthy. Um, trying to think what else is interesting for you. Paper, about 5,000 pounds. So in textiles, uh, there are some questions about textiles, and the ban went into effect in uh, 22, to November 22 for textiles to try to keep that weight out of your trash. And so there's still some confusion maybe about what can be recycled as a textile. And clothing can be recycled. Uh, linens, sheets, blankets, pillowcases, curtains can be recycled. Leather goods, shoes, belts, backpacks, purses can all go in those uh, re textile recycling bins, even stuffed animals. So it's, it's quite a wide range, and most things can be recycled to a point. Um, if it's ripped, if it's missing buttons or broken holes, you know, put it in. There's companies out there that sort everything 
and, and they, there is a place for that type of material. It just has to be dry and clean. A lot of people thought, think that it has to be usable or reusable. That's really not the case. Um, the things to look out for are if it's wet, either dry it out, don't throw it in the bin, because then mold will develop. Uh, if it's oily or greasy, if you did an oil change or worked on a car or something and you have stains on your pants, those should go in the trash. And hazardous substances, you know, I'm not sure what those might be, but fertilizer, pesticides, you know, if they're on the clothes and you're not washing them, those should go in the trash as well. So it's, people think of textile reuse as going into a store and buying a used piece of clothing. That's not necessarily the case. And we have some examples of what happens to that um, that we'll, we'll, in our question and answer, we can, dis we can talk about that. But wiping rags are, are a big thing. Um, insulation and, and padding products. Um, not to spoil it, but if, you've, if you have gotten some meal kits, you've probably have seen some of this reused product in your meal kits. Um, so really, textile recycling lowers the amount of weight in the trash. And some statistic says about 80 pounds of clothing per year gets, per person, gets thrown out. And that can be a huge amount, especially if your town is paying a tipping fee for the trash. And that's really the effort, that was really the, the emphasis behind the waistband, is to help reduce the amount of trash that's collected. Um, in either landfilled in Massachusetts or sent out to other states. So in a couple slides in summary, this is your recycling brochure for curbside. And so this really has all you need to know about what you can throw in your curbside tub. If you're not sure, you can always try to bring it to us. We can help sort it and we have places to put it. But generally look at the guidance you get um, about what should, should or should not be in there. Curbside recycling does get sorted by a combination of mechanical means and human hands. So they're trying to standardize and make that more efficient. Uh, tanglers are a big thing that is dangerous for everybody. Um, pieces of metal that aren't necessarily containers are, are a danger. So if you can follow the the guidance that you get from your town, I think that would help help everybody. Uh, one question was for the caps on the Tetra packs, the little cubes of liquids you, you buy in the store. The pack itself is not recyclable because there's film inside there, and the caps aren't recyclable on their own because they're too small. Right, They'll, they just get filtered out of the equipment right away. There is a company, I think they're still around, called Plastic Recycled that has a program similar to Trex where they will give you a bin, they'll collect caps, and then at the end you might get a bench or something out of it. So if, if there's a strong you know, effort or strong um, motion movement to, to you know, collect caps and other things, that might be something to look for. Um, and that's pretty much all I have prepared. So we wanted to leave time for questions and answers and, and other discussions. So from a curbside perspective, follow your local guidance, what the town of Sterling tells you to put in the bin and what Casella tells you to put into bin. If it's plastic and it's not in the picture, then unfortunately that should go in the trash. It's the Worcester store. Yeah. Uh, for some reason, depending, how they divvy up the geography. West Boylston is part of the Worcester um, area. I think so, yes. And I'm not really sure if um, the Lemonster store has the same kind of an event. I know the Ashland store started having a similar event and it's a really good fundraiser for Habitat. And as we said, we actually fill a tractor trailer container of Christmas stuff in the course of a year. So we will see it pretty much every day that we're open 
And um, you know, around the holidays, we're putting out what people are dropping off. But the things that get dropped off this afternoon are going to go in that trailer tomorrow. We, okay. get, we get both yeah. guidance. So in this specific um, recycling brochure, none of the glass has lids on it. Um, what, would, what happens to glass, I believe, is it gets broken right away um, and filtered out of the stream. So if there's a lid on there, it might go with the glass versus going with metal uh, to get uh, pulled off later. Um, so I think it's really up to the person running the recycling operation to, to let the residents know what they want. I think the thing specifically with the peanut butter that I always hear is that uh, the more important thing is getting the jar as clean as you can. <laughs> um, but then after that, yeah, if it's plastic on plastic, it's okay to leave the cover on. That was the last word that came out. And they've not been as clear on metal and glass. I think if they're separated, the, the lid hopefully will get scooped up by the magnetic system that pulls a lot of the metals out. And the glass will just continue on the glass track through the, through the um, site. Um, I did do a tour recently at the Casella and Republic site. And we walked around and we saw basically how they were scooping up the trash and putting it. And um, the Casella website has a lot of videos. Most of them do. And it's actually worth watching. It's interesting to see how what was in your bags suddenly is getting processed. And the thing that always strikes me when I see this is how many people are still physically doing a lot of the work. Somebody's job is to grab that plastic wrap that somebody put in their, their bin. Somebody else's job is looking for chains that got thrown in because people say, well, it's metal. I'm going to throw it in here. Those kind of things can shut down a plant for a whole day while they have to clean out, get things out of the gears. And on those videos, you'll see there are these giant, they almost look like chainsaw blades that are spinning things. Those just get covered in gunk. They get covered in the plastic, the chains, the hoses. Or heaven forbid you put in a big metal pipe that's just going to jam the thing. And like I said, they can shut down for a whole day. And now everybody's trash is backed up for the rest of the week. Are so. The, are the videos on their website? Yep, yep. Mm -hmm. they, have, they all have their own YouTube links. <laughs> And like I said, it's really fascinating to see um, and people who are you know, fishing through. Um, Mark also mentioned about checking with your haulers in your town to see what's collected. There is a lot of conflicting information, and it may even just depend on where you live in the state. For example, if you live out in the Springfield area, they can recycle their cartons out there. There is a company out there that manages that. We don't have that here. So if you looked at a Springfield site, they'd say, sure, give us your cartons, give us your Tetra Packs. We're happy to take them. We just don't have that here. So a lot of things can be recycled. They're not, if it's not convenient, if there's not a business that's doing that work locally. And then again, on the far end, recycling should be a closed loop. If you're not buying recycled materials, then there's no market then no one recycles it, then no one collects it, and it ends up in your trash. Some of the jars no, the, the number <laughs> really designates what kind of plastic it is. So to a recycler, if they want, say, number five, that matters to them. But the, what the state's putting out now for your recycling is don't go by the number, go by the usage, go by the shape. Is it a jar, jug, tub? Was it something that your food came in or your shampoo? Those kind of things can go curbside. Don't worry about the number. If it is something like this, which one of your folks brought in, that's trash. I think sharing information, which holding events like this is a great way to do that. Um, the other thing to keep in mind when you're even just looking at the recycling numbers, say for your town, I know earlier you were saying it's kind of static. But something that plays into that that we don't really think about is um, plastic weighs less than glass. If people are moving away from plastic and onto glass, it might look like your numbers went up. And also, if your numbers are staying static, some of you may not be buying all of those products anymore or buying your, your vegetables that come in a plastic bin. 
So that's going to look like your number went down in recycling when maybe it didn't only because you're not buying it anymore. Um, you know, we talk about waste reduction. It's like if you don't bring it into the house, you don't have to worry about what to do with it. And that can be really challenging when you go to the grocery store and everything is wrapped. Um, at Stop and Shop, they are sick of me and the produce department complaining that the produce they've marked down is now on a styrofoam tray. When it was full price, it was in a bin and I could just grab an apple. Now if I want to buy it off of that because I want to make apple pie with a variety, I have to get a styrofoam tray. <laughs> it's like, it's a waste. But that's how they've chosen to do their business, so I avoid it. Um, there, you can't always do that with things. And we're all kind of a little bit of slaves to convenience now. Um, you know, looking around the room, a lot of us can remember when it wasn't, everything didn't come in a little plastic tray, when you weren't worrying about what to do with that after. Um, so I, I too, when I'm driving around town and see what people have put out, I worry more about the things that didn't belong in that recycling bin, like the big pieces of styrofoam because they just bought a new TV. And occasionally the old TV is out on the curb as well. Um, again, it, it's education and hopefully working with the trash haulers on what they're seeing. Um, towns can ask their haulers to do audits and see if there's a certain neighborhood that needs a little more education than others. I know we did that in West Boylston just to get a sense of, you know, because it is a little bit of people will go with the flow. If everybody's bagging their recyclables, then your neighbors are going to start bagging their recyclables. And you don't want to do that. When I've gone to Casella, I've seen those bags just get pulled off the conveyor. All that went in the trash. So I think it's more than mm -hmm. confrontation. <laughs> Yes. Help us with books. <laughs> the library doesn't want books. Nobody seems to want books. What do we do with them? We do take books. Um, so our downstream partner, More Than Words, they don't want any encyclopedias, and they don't want any like law books or medical books. So we, if those come in in boxes, we do charge for those books to come to our site. Um, and then we'll either dispose of them in the trash or we have other groups come in that will rip the pages out of the book for recycling and then we'll throw the covers away. Um, but books, yeah, there's, I mean, if they're moldy, if you bring them out of your attic or basement and you, they're covered with mold um, and, you know, and you know they're moldy or mice, those can go, we have a paper recycling bin on our, our, our place, paperbacks can go in the recycling bin, but if there's really bad, it's really a trash item. So we try to, we get a lot of books in, uh, we try to put out all the good ones and the current ones, and then we box up and send to our partner. And what they do is they try to sell books, textbooks are okay. Um, if there's any vintage or antique or, you know, first editions that come through, they will handle that as well. So, um, and then things that they can't sell, I think they get a, a little bit of money for paper pulp. So it, the books do get recycled. And they work with a lot of transfer stations in the state. Um, it's a great program. Um, they do, you know, they manage all that, either selling it as a book, they sell worldwide. So even like an outdated, um, computer book here might be worth something in another country that's still on an old version. And they do get paid for their paper um, versus us. We pay to have it taken away. We are not doing anything specific for Earth Day, actually, on site. Uh, kind of, it's every day for us, so we don't really do a lot right then. Um, the town of West Boylston, but I think it's now the week after, we're doing our hazardous waste collection and town-wide cleanup. Um, I don't know, is Sterling's town-wide cleanup on Earth Day weekend? No. no? Okay. No, our paper is recycled. Really? Yep. So the difference with bringing paper to us versus, well, I don't know, I shouldn't say this, I'm not sure of you. Do you do paper and your containers all at the same time? Yeah. Okay. So when you do that, again, it all gets dumped on a floor the same and it goes through these processes of conveyor belts. Um, 
some of that paper doesn't make it into recycling because it, on a wet day, it's wet. It gets stuck to other things. And again, I think at the end of some of the videos you can see online, there's kind of the, the pile of everything that was left over. And a lot of times you'll see shredded paper in there, or tiny little bits of paper, as well as little bits of glass, little bits of plastics, the caps. Um, but if you bring paper, we have just a paper dumpster. When Harvey takes that, they take it to a different building that's only paper, mostly that comes from businesses they collect from. And they go through and they bale it and that gets recycled into whatever you can make recycled paper out of. Yeah, it depends on who you want to read and who you want to listen to. There's a lot of different studies out there. Some focus on a specific item. Some spo focus on the broad picture. Um, I don't know if it was a year or maybe two now ago. Uh, there was a, a study that came out and I think they said something like only 5% of plastics are recycled. It's a hoax and, and a lot of really good um, sustainability based organizations got behind that report. Well, the study actually was like of all plastic ever, ever made in any product ever. So like the vinyl on that chair, no that won't get recycled. But it wasn't talking just about your curbside kind of pieces. And part of that too, as I said, is there has to be a market for it. If nobody wants to make something else out of it, then it won't get recycled because they can't sell it. You know, it's just not a sustainable business. Um, but for the day-to-day -day things, hopefully, most of it is mm -hmm. getting recycled because there is still a market for that. And then you've got companies like Trex, when they first hit the market with a product, they were taking waste plastic and they were taking sawdust from sawmills. Well then we came up with the pellets for heating, so the sawdust suddenly had two markets competing for it. And I think that's when Trex became really aggressive about saying, well, I'm going to get my plastic cheaper. I'm not going to go out and buy plastic for my product anymore or, or scrounge it quite as much. I'm going to get all these great community groups to help us and help their community at the same time. But there has to be someone out there that wants to do that. Or Mark mentioned a small company we met a couple years ago <coughs> who takes the caps and tries to do something with them. Thank you. Just to add to that before we... Um, Cardboard is definitely recycled here in the U.S. There's, there's plants that have been stood back up to handle recycling cardboard. Um, paper, that should also be recycled. Uh, cardboard markets very, is getting stronger, the recycled cardboard. So um, paper, I think, is, is a little flat right now. In glass, you know, it can be used for other things. Um, or it can be remelted back into bottles depending on Who's, who's doing that. Um, there is a company we talked with that will take the glass and, and sell it to a, uh, a manufacturer and it becomes insulation, the fiberglass insulation then. So um, it really depends. Uh, metals, yes, definitely. Cardboard, yes. And then after that, it really depends on, on if there is a company in a market to, to do that. That's it. That's it. If you're gonna if you're gonna dispose of it at your home curbside, yes, it's once you shred it, it's a trash product. Um, if you want to pay a little bit, you can bring it to us and you can dump that into our paper bin. But we do charge a dollar or so for bags of, of paper. Um, but people do. There was a company bringing us large bags of shredded paper. Um, but since our container goes into their paper building at at the Harvey site in Westboro, it's not being, um, it doesn't interact with cans or bottles or wet, other wet things. So they can sort it within that building and package it the way they need to. Yes, yes, because it's, the food was in it. If it's a food container and it's plastic, it most likely is recyclable. The issue comes down to if it's black plastic. There's an issue with black plastics that there's, Optical scanners do a lot of the work of what is automated in the plants that process things. And the, the conveyor belts are black. It doesn't necessarily see black objects. Um, 
I'm told there are some blacks it can see, some that it can't, but we don't know what they use, so we don't know. So they often say the black plastic, that's trash. Thank you. Uh, Beth, was that your question? Yeah, that was my question. Okay, yes, sir. <laughs> um, is plastic covered paper recyclable? Like glossy magazine you know, paper? Like you get in junk mail that you often get. It's mm -hmm. not real paper, but it's sort of covered with a plastic like substance that makes it firmer. Um, I believe it is. So our, if you can, like um, plastic coated boxes or shiny covered boxes, if you can tear it and see the pulp on the inside, um, that is recyclable. Um, even the glossy magazines have a plastic or a, some kind of a film on there. And those aren't necessarily recycled as readily, but those do get accepted in the recycling bin. So, yep. Yes. Bonded together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the items like that, I think, again, it would be like, it's not, if it's a film plastic, it's not the kind of film these folks take. Therefore, it would be trash. And it is tricky when you buy things that are multiple kinds of material in one. Um, I brought an example of. psyllium container. So okay, it kind of looks like cardboard, but it's got a metal bottom and it's got some kind of liner inside that looks metallic. So if I really wanted to recycle this, I suppose I could try to peel all of the metal on the inside out because that also touched the food and it's dirty. This outside is probably a cardboard and then this might be a recyclable metal, but most people are not going to do that but you shouldn't put it in your recycling bin. If you're not going to do that, then it's your tra it's trash. My oatmeal things are all cardboard except the plastic rim on it. Mm -hmm. So I just pull that off. Yep, yep, that's fine. Um, we see that a lot with, I collect paint a couple times a year at the center, and they started doing the plastic cans. And everyone thought, oh, that's fabulous. They'll all get recycled. And they don't because they have a metal lid. So nobody wants to take the plastic and cut out the metal lid and do that extra work as far as a company that's going to recycle it. So we try to do things that are better and sometimes it's just not. The people making the item aren't thinking about end of life of that item. And there's a lot of legislation pending to go back and say, if you're going to make that, you're responsible for the leftovers at the end. And I strongly urge you to look into that if you're concerned about your trash and what you buy and whether or not it's convenient to buy things that are easy to get rid of. That's a, that's a really good option. <clears throat> We've had wildlife rehab wildlife people yep. come, come in and grab newspapers out of our dumpster for injured animals that they found. And then they also grabbed a lot of coolers because there's a bunch of possums I think they rescued and they were putting them in the coolers. Coolers are very useful for wildlife. Yeah. So we, we're always, we definitely want to support the reuse aspect versus the recycling because, you know, it's easier. <laughs> <laughs> definitely easier. Uh, yes, sir. Did you have a question? The clear is recyclable. The black, because it's black, may not get recycled because the machine can't pick it up. So that would be trash. Okay. So if they would do it in blue plastic, would be fine. <laughs> Or look at your hauler's information to see if they specify to take it out. Yeah, I closed it, but on the Casella web, on the flyer and what you have on the, it shows a clear container, top and bottom. Mm. Yeah. So if it's two distinct pieces, I would wash them out, recycle the clear, throw away the black. If you get a takeout clamshell, sometimes you have the bottom. I mean, I've I've cut them, you know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So cut the clear off and and throw the black out for now, until we have some other kind of guidance on if they do take it, or if there's another company that will, you mm -hmm. know, stand up and take the the black specifically. Uh, I think I had a question. Did you have a question, ma'am? Ooh, good one. We got a couple over here. 
Um, so they should be empty, used up as much as possible, but then from a curbside perspective, trash. They would go in trash. You're welcome. Again, so again, the, the potential of it might get recycled is the best I can offer you because what we've heard at Casella, there's a two inch by two inch screen that separates the, the broken bits from the larger bits that then go get recycled. So this one will probably not get recycled because it's too small. This one has a chance of getting recycled, but it, just be aware it may not. So the other thing, we, we do get aerosol cans for metal recycling. And what we do is then we have to, and if they're empty, what we'll do is we'll pierce them so there's no pressure inside and throw them in our metal bin. But this they one still has like that. this they one. Recycle. Circle. They are recyclable, but a lot of the trash pickup gets compressed, they explode. So, and if there's product in them, it makes a mess. <laughs> So yeah. that's why they say they don't want them because it's just going to wreak havoc on the trucks. Right. So what you're recommending then is if you have these, is you can start a container to put them in mm -hmm. and then bring them by your facility because you'll take them as metal. If they're completely empty, yeah. This one. So you can recycle. This one may have the propellant gone, but there's still product in here. So you might want to pierce it with a nail and use the oil on your whoever brought this one in <laughs> and use the oil at home until it's gone. You want to pull more stuff? Let's see, what do we got? Um, we had a little show and tell. A glass light fixture is, is not recyclable. So flat glass, um, cooking glass, Pyrex, stuff like this is trash. Just because it's glass, it doesn't mean it's the type of glass they want to recycle. Container glass is a little different composition. Again, being food safe versus who knows what that was or what kind of coating on it. Um, so we were looking at containers earlier, and this one is all paper. But again, um, unless you've washed this, it's not clean. And like. It ha recycling has to be clean. Um, the contamination problem is, is significant when it gets into the mix. It can ruin everything else that you took the time to clean out. Some of those have a plastic, a little bit of a plastic liner in them. Right, again, so that'd be trash. Trash? Yep. Because it's too, it's too many materials together. This is an example of what happens with those single holy socks that we put in our textile <laughs> recycling. Um, you can see if you want to take a look at it, there's all kinds of yarn and thread and bits of material in here. Things that you can put in textile recycling that no one's going to wear again, no one's going to be able to sell. This is an example of what happens. It gets shredded up into next to nothing and then repackaged into something else. This was from one of the meal kits. It has a plastic wrapper on it when you get it in your meal kit and it says recyclable all over it. That piece of plastic is recyclable via film plastic recycling, but this I'm not 100% sure. Sometimes we put it in the textile recycling and otherwise we try to just give this back out to people for their packing. We've always got people looking for packing materials at the center, so we try to just keep it repurposing, keep it out there over and over again. Oh, can I see that? So this also gets used in automotive so mm -hmm. once, once the cotton clothes is shredded like this, it's kind of in insulation underneath the carpet of your car. Um, some of this also is in mattresses. Um, so yeah, recycling, this is kind of a one-time recycling thing. The cotton got made into this, and this probably can't be recycled again. It should just be reused. Um, we found this actually is a great fire starter <laughs> if, you're gonna, if you're gonna burn, so it's all cotton. So. Um, if you have way too much of it and you like to have campfires and such, that's a good way to do it. <clears throat> okay, something we've added, we've had it for a couple of years now, is styrofoam recycling. Um, but it is the packing styrofoam. It's this rigid white 
Um, our, our guy who takes it has a market for a white styrofoam, um, not the polka dot styrofoam, not the beige styrofoam, not the blue styrofoam. So we, we will go through when people drop things off and, and we try to pull out just the white. Um, and even though a lot of the food stuff comes in white styrofoam or the styrofoam white cups, we can't take those because a lot of things have seeped into that styrofoam and he just doesn't have a market for it. Um, some other parts, again, of Massachusetts might. I know New Hampshire does take the other kind of styrofoam, but they process it differently. They have someone who will buy that from them. And what they do is they feed in a small amount of that into the mix when they're doing the shredding. Because what happens to this is he shreds it up into almost a fine dust. Then it goes through an extruder that heats it up and it comes out in like a cinder block sized lump of plastic. That then gets turned into other plastic. But again, there's not many people doing this anymore. It's pretty labor intensive. We're fortunate that we have someone that will drive out to get it. Um, and he's able to sell it. Before the pandemic, most of it was going up to Canada to be turned into plastic molding, like picture frames or even molding for houses. Um, since the pandemic, Canada kept its doors closed for a long time for our trucks crossing the border. And so some of it might be going back out to Asia and China, but that's where they're making most of the plastic items. So that's where the market used to be. I believe you know Canada's opened back up again for an, a long enough time that more of it's going up there. But like I said, that's kind of the end you don't see of the life cycle of whatever you've brought home is where does it really end up. It's, it's so dependent on a, a variety of things. I've not heard that. I mean, if that came from your hauler and they don't want it, that's one thing. But um, I've not heard that. Um, they, they we will happily take those at the recycle center to give out to the local egg people. <laughs> They actually do show an egg carton in the cardboard and paperboard. Right. So the, yeah, as long as there's no broken egg in egg material right. on the carton, then it can go into that. Um, so yeah, I, in our opinion, either the paperboard or the plastic would be the better two choices out of the three. They make good fire starters too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about um, peanuts? They're making a different We do, but we put it out for reuse, not recycling. Right. I can't pass those styrofoam peanuts on for recycling, um, but we give them away for reuse. Okay. And the other ones, I believe, are reactive. If they get wet, they just disintegrate into nothing. And starchy ones. So if they're, if they're clean, yeah. we, we will bag them up and put them out for people who want to ship things. Um, if it's dirty or mixed up with other stuff, then we have to throw that in the trash. So, yes, sir. Personally, I, I think they've kind of done as much as they can by paring it down to just these items. Um, and if it doesn't meet your criterion here, then it should just de facto go in the trash or like metal, other types of metal will take. Um, other types of, you know, aluminum cans or something. Is there, is there something at the national level that's trying to uh, make this more consistent? At the state level, they came, kind of came up with the pictures you're seeing. Like okay. I said, instead of looking at a number, look at the shape. Okay. Look at what the use was. Again, that doesn't mean those other things can't be recycled. It just means this is where there's a strong market and they feel confident that things are going to get managed properly. All the other things can have value but are tougher to recycle. At a higher level, unfortunately, then you're dealing with things like branding. You know, if I held up an orange tub that was shaped like what you, you know, do your laundry soap with, you would know what brand that was because they do everything in bright orange. Mm -hmm. Luckily, the machines can see bright orange. We were talking about the black plastic quite a bit because that's just a standard and it's cheap and it's made, we keep using it. If they stop doing that, another color, I know sometimes my mushrooms come in a blue or a green container, not black. Um, my chicken comes on a clear plastic now, not black. 
So things that you can buy differently, companies are making that move. Again, um, extended producer responsibility laws or have been trying to be passed in, in Massachusetts for several years now. They're hard to get through. Um, some of our surrounding states have done it. That puts the onus back on whoever made it, that they're now responsible for it, or they may have to start paying a little money to, have, to help towns recycle it. Um, that's the closest they've come to at sort of a higher level. But it's state by state. And again, it's kind of voting with your buying dollars. If you stopped buying it, they'd find a way to get you back. Mm -hmm. And if that means making it in something different, then they will. But as long as we keep fueling it. Sure. And sometimes I said it's, it's difficult. There are days I, I spend way too much time in the market trying to make a decision <laughs> over what I'm going <laughs> to buy because of what is packed in. And you can just go nuts. Yeah, I would just add that I think what I was thinking before is like this audience is probably well educated on recycling and and it's important to, to the audience. The, the neighbors may not be that educated on recycling or care about it as much. Um, again, it's just going to be, you know, the towns will have to flood that with, with literature or maybe audits. Um, but I think, I mean, this is fairly simple. I think if people follow this, then, you know, it's, it's, it's working. The, the trucks are picking it up. <clears throat> it's being sorted as best it can. It's being bailed and sent out for further processing and, and recycling. Um, Norma said earlier that be careful where you get your information from. There's a lot of high-level doomsday people saying it, it's not working, but I think since we have it here in, in Massachusetts, um, we have it at your curbside, it's convenient. If you follow the, the guidance here, you can feel good about it. So at the recycling center, we take them for free and we give them out for free. And during the pandemic, they went out as fast as they came in. Now we're getting a backlog, either they're coming back or people aren't as interested in biking anymore. Um, we are looking at reestablishing our, our uh, relationship with Earn a Bike in Worcester. And what they do is they help uh, youth uh, build their own bike out of the parts and pieces that, that they have lying around. So it's both an education on how to maintain and build a bike and also you can ride it afterwards. Um, we're still trying to stand that up and get that reestablished. But we, if it's a really bad frame, we will put it in a metal pile for recycling. Okay. But we try to give it back out to the community. Um, so if you see a pile of bikes, that's why there's a pile of bikes there, just to get, get you know, someone who's interested. The kids' bikes go fast. Mm -hmm. um, they grow, grow them, and also grandparents will pick up bikes if, if grandchildren are visiting for a week or so, and they have a bike, you know, and then they'll bring it back. So <laughs> that happens with toys as well. Yeah. You see that a lot with our outdoor toys. Someone will be going through and say, well, the grandkids are coming this weekend. And they'll bring a few things home. And then I'll see them two weeks later dropping the same things back off. Um, so it's a great cheap rental to, to have something for them to do. Or we get that with the, with the games and the puzzles in the building, is people just come in. You know, it's basically like borrowing it from the library. Bring it back when you're done, or pass it on somewhere else. That's fine, too. So have most of you visited us? Is there anybody here who never has? Oh, well, maybe doesn't want to tell us. Because <laughs> I know I see a few familiar faces. I see volunteers in the audience, and I see people that I call frequent flyers that we see on a pretty regular basis. But a lot of faces I don't recognize. Maybe I just don't see you on the days that I'm there. Um, but we're, we're really thrilled to be able to work with all seven towns. Uh, we're very unique in that we're on state property. We work with seven specific towns. And it's primarily volunteer run. And at the end of the year, when we're preparing reports for the towns, Mark spends a lot of time on the data, analyzing it and figuring out the proportions per town and stuff. And the thing that always catches me at the end is how many tons of material this group of about 100 volunteers in total manages in a year. And the people that we see, how many cars come through the site, um, what you don't see when you're dropping off 
is that on the days that we're not open to the public, we have other people there managing all that stuff. They're unpacking what was dropped off for the building. They're trying to organize the, the gardening center pots, especially this time of year. Um, so we, we have to like try to keep the place picked up, try to keep things moving, meet with the haulers, do all these other things off hours. Uh, but we have just as many, if not more, that work on those off hour shifts than are there during the public hours. Um, and it, again, it's just mind blowing to me how much stuff that goes through there. And I've been looking a little bit at the furniture more closely now. As we said, we put up this new pavilion. During the pandemic, I got a small grant to rent the my boxes you've seen on site with the big bright yellow doors. And they're basically storage pods. We, we initially thought we had to quarantine everything that came in, because that was the, the word when we opened back up again. So the things for the drop off for the building went into quarantine overnight, and then we'd deal with it. Well, we just found that process works great for us, so we're continuing it. But the other containers we got were larger and we were able to put furniture in because we had started relationships with furniture banks. During the pandemic, people were desperate to get out of shelters into a home where they'd feel safer not being in the public. And furniture banks couldn't go into people's homes and get furniture anymore. So we were sort of a go-between. You could drop it off outside, we'd put it in a container, the furniture bank would come and get it. And we kind of kept that cycle going. From the numbers we tracked there, we were able to get a bigger grant to put up that pavilion. And we're far exceeding what I told the state that we could do as far as furniture reclamation. Um, and my plan was that we were going to have to start rehabbing some of this furniture ourselves to make it worthwhile. At this point, we haven't had to. Uh, we're able to pass more on. And I never used to track what residents would just randomly take. We, we want you to take it, but I wasn't really ever counting that. Now that I am, I'm like really pleased at how much people are finding at the center. Again, whether it's someone's got family coming and they need an extra bed for a couple of weeks, or any other reason that they want a piece of furniture, um, they lost something. And uh, it's, again, not a lot of communities have something like this. So I think at the end of the day, even on the days that are you know, not beautiful weather like this, or um, you know, when we, we have a few grumpy customers, it's kind of at the end of the day, it's better to be thinking about like all the good that we did or all the impact it had. And it's based a lot on the community cooperating with us and bringing us the stuff and being as engaged as a lot of you are. <laughs>